Hello and welcome to Tatvadeep Conversations in Explorations. For our first episode on biology, we sat down with Dr. John Van Wy. Dr. John is a historian of science who specializes on Charles Darwin, Alfred Russel Wallace, and the history of evolution. He is the founder and director of Darwin Online and has published 15 books and lectures and broadcasts around the world. We discussed what it means that accident is the first building block of life. what makes something alive the missing link the great english naturalist mr charles darwin and his idea of what god might be we hope this conversation can help the listeners see the tatva or the true essence of biology and its potential to help us understand how life came to be and the various ways in which it evolves with and through humans as well as all other living beings Uh hello Dr John welcome to Tatvadeep Hello So I'd like to start with the most basic question to get things started for us what is biology Well biology quite simply is the study of life the study of living things So uh, is there anything else you'd like to add to it Well like all sciences it has changed over time mm-hmm. uh whatever science you choose chemistry or astronomy the further back you go in time the more different it is mm. from today so what they studied in past centuries we might still recognize as biology but it's not the same as practice uh, today today it's become of course a very sophisticated natural science sure Yeah I think we'll get into what that means a little later uh, in our conversation. So uh, I I started to think about biology. I had it in school and that's about it, right? And uh, after watching a couple of your videos that are available uh, that are available online and reading a couple of uh, things and visiting your website uh, Darwin online, I started to wonder if evolution is the central quest of biology. And if if so, what was this central quest before evolution uh, uh, uh was came about as a concept and um yeah and before and uh, what has it what what is the central quest now yeah that's basically the question right well it is difficult to boil down the activity of so many people in a large community around the world as being about one topic or question there's lots and lots of questions that are investigated but so with that in mind i would say that before uh, evolution was accepted most uh, naturalists as they were called were studying the structure of living things analyzing how they worked why they were shaped the way they were and so on and also classifying them mm-hmm. so as because in earlier times more and more species of plants and animals were constantly being found mm-hmm. and so a lot of work was about simply naming them and classifying them. Mm-hmm. whereas nowadays that's a, perhaps a secondary consideration mm-hmm. and the focus has turned more and more towards um deeper uh, molecular level explanations of how li- how life works how living things work so uh, originally it would have been on the level of the individual plant or animal but nowadays more of the focus is on the dna the genes and how that actually works out at uh, at a very very tiny level so it's become very specialized and that means it's more difficult for the average person to understand what it's all about whereas mm-hmm. in the past everyone could understand a flower or a mm-hmm. squirrel mm-hmm. if that was the level of discussion or analysis mm-hmm. and nowadays it's less about why how does the squirrel carry a nut from one tree to another mm-hmm. but more about um, how is it that the the dna of the squirrel has allowed it certain parts of its um behavior to be passed on through generations or something like that so the, the minutiae mm-hmm. is is very 
complicated for for a yeah for a lay audience today okay right so uh, how i have divided my questions for you is like uh, i'd like to cover as much as we possibly can and as much as i've been able to uh, you know articulate myself through my questions I've, these are the categories something i'd like to cover a bit about evolution first and then maybe go on to uh, your experience as an historian and uh, all of those things so staying on the topic of evolution for my next question uh, have you heard this phrase i'm, I'm I don't know how uh, common or popular it is. Accident is the first building block of evolution. I heard I it. I haven't. I haven't come across that one. I don't think, but I know what what um, the writer of that is getting at. And I, which is yeah. Yeah, you'll find it interesting. I I first heard it in a film, and the film did not have anything directly to do with bi uh, biology, but with physics. Interstellar. So uh, it was a a part of a dialogue that uh, one of the female leads was saying and she says yeah accident is the first building block of evolution and i you can walk down a certain road i i know the meanings of all these words and i can also kind of put them together but i'd like to hear what you what you would have to say to what it could mean yeah okay well that's actually <laughs> coming from a movie that's actually quite a quite a good one <laughs> because i actually show film clips to my students where mm -hmm evolution is described in a completely inaccurate and ridiculous way. You know, evolution does this, and evolution solves these problems. Which are some of the films that you use then to do that? Uh, oh gosh, um, there's <laughs> uh, one of the Superman movies. I think it's The Man of Steel. I think it's oh, really? Superman, The Man of Steel. Yes. and. And in it, uh, Superman is fighting a, an alien from his planet, and she tells him uh, that you have a sense of, oh, I don't know, empathy or sympathy or something like that. Um, but if there's one thing we know, she says, evolution always wins. Uh -huh. <laughs> and things like that. So if you, if you hear a summary or a shorthand description of, of any science in a movie, be very skeptical because yeah, 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 yeah. after all it's, it's a it's a movie yeah and probably written by people who don't know any science but sure. anyway getting back to the one mm -hmm. you mentioned mm -hmm. about what was it accidents accident is the uh, first building block of evolution yes well it, that's actually kind of accurate in the sense that the modern theory of evolution works like this that living things when they are born or grow, uh, they all vary. They're all a little bit different. Mm. They're not all exactly the same. Mm. And that could be the result of a mutation or it could simply be the result of sexual reproduction where two individual animals or plants mix their genes and the result is different mm -hmm. from the parents. You don't just get lots of clones. Mm -hmm. And so those, all those little differences you can think of them as accidental in the sense that they are not uh, designed or predestined mm. to work out mm. in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. Whatever is going to be thrown at life changes in the environment, for example. Mm -hmm. So you can see them as accidental from the perspective of being useful or not. In mm -hmm. fact, most things, most most mutations turn out to be not useful. Mm -hmm. They're not uh, lucky accidents. They're mm -hmm. just accidents. And those things probably won't survive. Mm -hmm. But let's say the environment is changing. Uh, let's say, for example, a region of the world is becoming drier and drier over the years. Now, the plants or the birds that, that live there uh, cannot directly react and become more drought uh, ready. Mm -hmm. All that can happen is that any of them that happen to be born that have some feature that works a bit better survives a bit better in that dry environment those will tend to survive mm. but that can only happen if such things accidentally arise which they do all the time things are constantly being born that are a little bit different mm. and usually usually nothing happens as a result of that but under some circumstances, these accidents will uh, turn out to be useful. So here's a, here's a very striking example. You can mm. take cave fish. There are many caves in the world with fish in them. 
And very often these fish have no eyes. They live in permanent darkness underground. They don't need eyes, but their ancestors came from the surface. They were normal fish with eyes. Mm -hmm. How did they lose their eyes? Because of these accidents, fish are born. I mean, how many billions of fish are born out of eggs every day in the world? It's, right. it's a staggering number. Mm -hmm. Some of those have a mutation, which means they're born without eyes. Mm -hmm. That occasionally happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, out in the normal world, in the sea or in a river, a fish without eyes is not going to do very well. Sure. But if that one of those is born in a cave, that will actually have a little advantage over the its fellow fish that have eyes because an eye is a very costly organ to grow and to maintain. It takes calories to support such organs, but underground, they're no use. Mm -hmm. So a fish that's accidentally born without eyes does a little bit better than the others. So in that way, you can see accidents as, yeah, as a starting point. And, and, have, change. and in this case, having some ut utility in the case of the cave fish. Yeah. 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 And so, but because when I hear the word accident, this is what it sounds like to me, something that should not have happened. And then that's, that's, that's the, that's the, let's say the emotional baggage that the word carries for just a lay person. Right. And then when I, uh, because we've also been doing these uh, interviews with physicists and mathematicians and, you know, uh, with linguist, linguists also, there is something like mathematicians talk about the unreasonable effectiveness of math. Like, why is there anything at all? And then this accident bit kind of fits in that, oh, just happened. <laughs> you know, so I, I, I was not able to reconcile yeah. with this word. That and another thing that I'd like to uh, first, we uh, if you could uh, walk us down this, uh, you've given us an understanding of what you mean, but maybe perhaps a little deeper about the use of this word on the part of a non biologist, of a very clever, creative writer. Uh, this is Christopher no Nolan's brother. So it's from that film. And then uh, what I also want to understand is that we are, from, from what I have uh, researched, it seems that. Uh, there is the environment and then there are the beings that live in the environment and there is I don't know if there is a separation but there is certainly a mutual coexistence but where environment seems to have an upper hand that we have to adapt to the environment things are changing now I know that humans are having an impact on the environment but when things began we were constantly adapting so does it mean to say that what does it mean to say and am I right in saying that that once upon a time earlier in, in the stages of uh, the planet coming into being, the first organism, uh, the first point of life coming into being, it had to adapt to where it was, not the other way around. So first accident, and then perhaps uh, if we can walk down this road. Yeah, well, of course, accident, the word accident, like most words can carry any number of undertones. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at, uh, a country or a large busy city, uh, such as you have very many busy cities in India, sure. uh, how many accidents happen every day? I mean, if you just think of road accidents mm -hmm. or other accidents of something falling on people's head from a building or something, mm -hmm. such things happen um, unintentionally, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, if you count them up, they tend to be, occur quite regularly. Yeah. So that there are certain number of thousands of accidents every year, for example, mm. um, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, they are not planned, they're not intentional, but they do happen a lot. And it's actually quite the normal uh, course of events. Right. That, 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 that accidents always happen. Yeah. And it's the same in biology mm -hmm. that uh, with the recombination of DNA from, from two parents, you not only get offspring that are different, but sometimes the, the mixing of the molecules doesn't work entirely accurately, and you get little changes, mm -hmm. which you could call accidents. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of them. Right. So I understand from what you're saying. So one is in the human world, the word accidents we, and, and how it might play out in real life. We, we like to avoid as many accidents as possible. So there is water or there's a banana peel you know, try not to step on it. But still, you know, these strange things happen and not, none, nothing is without a consequence. 
there's all whether an accident happens doesn't happen there's always a, a a consequence accident seems to be like a coming in the way of a series of pleasant or, or expected consequences but when it comes to accidents as we are seeing as it, as it's being applied here in terms of evolution it's the first building block so yes what they what what what's being what what is meant by building block is that what Darwin called natural selection mm -hmm. is the process whereby some things live and some things die and their actual characteristics, mm -hmm. the organism's characteristics make a difference to whether it lives or dies or how well it survives and reproduces in its environment. Mm -hmm. And these accidental changes or variations mm -hmm in each individual will make a difference to whether or not they live or die in the human world when we use the term accident i suppose we also mean whether or not there is any blame or guilt mm -hmm. is anyone responsible which well maybe someone is responsible for a, mm -hmm. for a car accident for example mm -hmm. but some things some accidents really are not the result of human failure for example, sometimes people are struck by lightning. That happens hundreds of times every year, mm -hmm. perhaps thousands of times. It's very, it does happen a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an accident. That's usually no one's fault, unless, of course, they're playing golf during a, <laughs> during a thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. But yes, so accidents are inevitable and they're very common. Mm -hmm. And in biology, there is no sense of intention or blame uh, mm -hmm. behind these because there isn't any. Mm -hmm. These are just things that happen mm -hmm. naturally. Right. And it's uh, like uh, the other part of the second part of the question was uh, the upper hand of the environment, at least in the beginning of all things. Is, is, am I right in saying that? I would say that it was true then and it's true now that living things have to adapt to a changing world. And that's always been the case. The world is not static. It has always been changing mm -hmm. one way or that. For example, the earth has gone through many ice ages. Mm -hmm. They take millions of years, but they come and they go. That's a massive upheaval mm -hmm. to the environments of the world and the things that live in them. Some things slowly adapt to these to the changing world and their descendants keep on living. Mm -hmm. Other things don't adapt quickly enough and they die out and go extinct. Mm -hmm. And that's still the case today that um, the environment is, is primarily what living things have to adapt to. But of course, the environment in, in one sense doesn't just consist of the weather and the land and so on, but you can also see the environment is consisting of the other things that live there. Yeah. So for, from the perspective of any particular animal, mm -hmm. um, its environment consists not only of the weather and the trees and the, the rocks and so on, but also all the other things that live in that place. Mm -hmm. sure. that's, that's all part of its environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So w when you think, uh, w w when you talk about something being alive, something being alive, what is it that you're talking about? Like, are you like fundamentally, what's the first, the grassroots thing of what makes a thing alive? Is it movement? Is it growth? And how are those two different? Or is something still more fundamental than that? Yes, there are a number of definitions of what counts as something being alive. And mm -hmm. some are better than others, but I don't think any of them are completely perfect. And there comes a point where you have to give up on quarreling about definitions mm -hmm. because it becomes fruitless or not productive. Mm -hmm. When we, I would say that the most basic thing that all living things have in common mm -hmm. is that they are descended from something else that was alive. There is nothing anywhere that is alive that is not descended from parents. Mm -hmm. So life begets life. Life is a continuous process. So everything that we include under the term alive has that in common. Some people, for example, would say that viruses are not alive because they lack some of the characteristics that, that we 
would otherwise use in a definition of life. Right. They lack some of those things. Like they don't, they're unable to reproduce by themselves. They need a host cell to hijack and then that allows them to do their thing. Mm. Uh, but are they alive? Well, they evolve, uh -huh. they have offspring. What, what about water? What about rocks? Is it the right yes. question to ask? A, yeah. Any, well, I think one, sh one can ask any question and the answer to those would be no. Water and rocks are not alive mm. in the sense that water doesn't make more water. <laughs> Um, it is a, uh, a chemical phenomenon mm. and it can change state and so on. And the molecules in water can break up and become parts of other chemicals. But water doesn't give birth to new water. Right. Or, or the same for rocks. Or... I mean, if water splits, it's no longer water. Right? If it's, well, if the, if the molecules split. Molecules. Yes. That's what I meant. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Huh. Then we would call it um, oxygen, hydrogen. Correct. Atoms. But it's, 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 you know, uh, uh, Dr. John, what's been happening here? See, we, we are non-experts. A lot of us are non-experts. And, uh, but there are a lot of these documentaries out there that we've been accessing because people seem to gen gen generally have a known, unknown, conscious, unconscious interest in these things and a bit of ideas that physics is uh, putting out. Are there too many universes? Bit of ideas that maths is putting out, you know? Bit of ideas that biology has been putting out. So I've seen these documentaries where, say, where, where they say that uh, water has memory. So here we say, yeah, <laughs> water has memory and that uh, they have done these experiments uh, where you put water in, in two jars in two separate rooms and uh, in one what you do is you say kind words to what you are interacting with water uh, in a totally different way like you would with another living being with the kindness compassion and saying nice words to it and another room another jar of water it's the same water just in two different jars. You, you are, you're, you're being violent, you're fighting with one another, you know, and then it seems the water is taking on the properties. This is a part of a documentary that I've seen. And a lot of people have seen and we've come to believe it to be so that all the people that I've spoken to about this documentary come to be, have come to believe it to be so without being themselves uh, there when the, when the experiment was taking place. It just appeals to us on a, on a on, I don't know, on a logical level on something on an I don't know on what level it appeals to us, but if it has memory and if it's taking on properties, but we're also calling it not alive. So how do we reconcile this? Yes, well, <laughs> I have heard of that sort of thing. Mm. Um, I, would, I would say that water does not have memory uh, in, in the normal use of the English word memory. And if it did, then that, those experiments could be repeated in laboratories all around the world and we and it wouldn't be uh controversial or contested which it is okay. so i wouldn't no i wouldn't accept that one um okay. the the problem is of course that we live in a world in which there are um, you know, programs podcasts articles videos and documentaries that say millions of things mm -hmm. and some of them are not accurate and how are we supposed to know as as someone who's not an expert um, now you were referring to yourself or to your viewers as not being experts but in a way everyone is not an expert at most things i'm an expert at a couple of things but i'm not an expert on chemistry or football for that matter Mm -hmm. So that so so I think the one the, the only advantage for me outside of my area of expertise is that I am familiar with how many things are said about my area area of expertise that are wrong that are unbelievably incredibly wrong. Mm -hmm. I see it all the time, mm -hmm. and I can only imagine that all the other areas of expertise about which I don't have probably have lots of mistakes in them too but i can't see them because i'm not an expert in those things right so i know how many there are in my area mm -hmm. so there's probably lots in every other area too mm -hmm. so what we as as uh normal curious people can do about that is of course we can't become experts at everything no one can mm -hmm. but we can at least be prepared 
to know that that exists, that there's lots of things out there that are printed or broadcast that aren't correct. Mm -hmm. And we should always just be a, a bit skeptical. Mm -hmm. And open-minded, right? And, and, and acknowledge the fact that, well, I'm not an expert on this mm -hmm. and someone claims this or that, mm -hmm. but that might not be true mm -hmm. because there's probably a large community mm -hmm. of experts on that area mm -hmm. and I'm not one of them. Mm -hmm. So I don't, it's hard to know. So sometimes we have to reserve judgment mm -hmm. on some things, unless something completely flies in the face of some area of expertise, then I think we can be more than skeptical mm -hmm. when we hear a claim. Well, for example, one thing that we should always ask is who's saying this? What is what, the, the people who wrote this or who made this video? What is their expertise? Mm -hmm. What are their qualifications? Mm -hmm. Are they journalists? Are they mm -hmm. scientists? Mm -hmm. That those are important questions that any of us can ask. Yeah. And that gets you, I think, many steps closer to being prepared not to accept things that aren't uh, well accredited by, by the real experts, because there are some out there. Sure. <laughs> Even if we don't, don't know them. Sure. Uh, I, I, I get what you're saying. In fact, we had one philosopher of mathematics, and uh, his whole philosophy was based on doubt. And uh, that things, I think, are so far I've been able to see it this way, but it might not, it might just turn around uh, and, and, and be totally different in a few years. And he said, yes, that's how I, that's the thing from my uh, experience and my time with the, that I've spent with philosophy that I've been able, that insight I've been able to draw back into my life. And now it's not like I'm suspicious and I hold back. I, what I don't hold myself back, I hold my judgment back. So for a lot of people I've also noticed this the, the the sense of certainty gives security and the sense of uncertainty gives insecurity but what you're saying and what perhaps he's also saying uh, to be a doubting formus in that sense to but how to be and then and to still take solace from the fact that uh, i don't know it seems like nobody else knows either and it's all right life goes on so it's <laughs> you know what, what, it's like it's like what we're talking right now is developing a philosophy of life which uh, allows you to be isn't it? And you don't get caught up at too many ideologies and you don't get caught up at, in, 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 in making sure you come to some conclusion, verified or not verified. But there must be something that I must hold on to. And perhaps that's what makes it difficult for us to give up on our beliefs because that's where my certainty comes from. But what you're saying is keep an open mind, see who's giving you, who's the provider of this information, their credibilities, and uh, that everything, the, the, the that we have limitations as human beings in knowing who we are, what's around us, there are limitations and it's there's practical value in accepting our limitations and still not being bogged down by it, correct? Yes, absolutely. It's it's one, it, look, you will probably always be safer and more accurate if you say, I heard that people say that this exists, so this is true, right? Now, if you say, I heard someone say it, or I saw a video that says it, what you're saying is completely accurate. That video says it, or that article says it, or that book says it, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, I heard this is true, which you're getting a bit more slippery. Right. So if you, if you keep it at the level of someone has claimed this, right? then yeah. And also, there are things which no one, not even an expert, will know. And so sometimes we reach the, the limits or the borders of what we can know right. for certain. Right. And when we reach that point, it is very difficult, but we need to try to suspend judgment. Right. Say, well, actually, I'm not sure if it's this way or that way, yeah. because there's just not enough evidence right now to know one way or the other. It's right. hard for human beings to do that. It's not very satisfying, yeah. but you, you will end up probably being safer and more accurate if you do. Right. Um, so, yeah. Okay, now, uh, uh, yeah, I think we've reconciled some interesting uh, points here about biology and I think generally about life also, I think so. So coming back to our 
subject today. I want to understand from you, what is this deal about the missing link? Uh, what is its origin? The opposition it has faced and uh, 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 places where it has found acceptance and where does it currently stand? Right, well, the missing link is a phrase that people have been using, oh, for more than 150 years. Hmm. Probably beca it became most popular after Darwin's Origin of Species was published. And then his uh, other most uh, controversial book, The Descent of Man, which discussed human beings being descended from other kinds of animals. Okay. And people who were very unhappy with this idea said they claimed that there was a missing link between humans and any other creatures, that there wasn't a, uh, an unbroken uh, chain or set of links between, say, apes and humans. Mm -hmm. And it's a very catchy phrase and it's never gone away. Mm -hmm. But if you talk to a biologist or a paleontologist who study fossils, well, they can explain to you that there is no such thing as a missing link. There, are, okay. there, are, there, is, there isn't one. Uh, the fossil record for our family of animals, mm -hmm. uh, not just, I mean, beyond the, the, beyond the primates, but actually the, the hominids, which is what we are, is very abundant now. Mm -hmm. We have a huge number of fossils showing that we, are, we used to be part of a large family of animals. Mm -hmm. that walked on two legs okay and we weren't the, we're not the only ones we're just mm -hmm. the only ones left which if you'll pardon the pun we're the last man standing mm -hmm. but there used to be uh, lots of these two-legged uh, ape creatures mm -hmm. um, and some are more like us and some less so mm -hmm. but those cre those were the most intelligent animals on earth so that is before us right so before we evolved Mm. There was a family of animals. Mm -hmm. They were a type of ape. Mm -hmm. They walked on two legs. They had pretty big brains. They were very intelligent. They made tools. Mm -hmm. They could uh, use fire if they found it naturally burning from lightning or something. Oh. So those brilliant animals walking on two legs, some of them gave rise to us. And we have an absolutely amazing fossil record for it. So... When you hear people saying today that there's a missing link, they simply don't know what they're talking about because there isn't. The fossil record is excellent. We don't have such a good fossil record for chimpanzees as we do for ourselves. Okay. Because chimpanzees live in African forests mm -hmm. and fossils don't really form there. I know. And as far as I know, we don't have any fossils of chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But nobody's talking about the missing link with chimpanzees, sure. but there is one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so what I, I think that, that this begs a question. So we were talking about how our adaptation to the environment uh, kind of asserts, asserts whether we, whether a species goes on or not. Ideally, this is, let's, let's say, uh, sticking to our suspended judgment way of looking at things. This is the best we have that uh, a species continues because it adapts well to the environment. So these other hominids uh, from whom we have descended, in what way did they not adapt to the environment that they went missing completely and that in what way did we adapt well to the environment that we're still here mm, yes that's a very good question the right the, i think the first species of them that left africa was called homo erectus which mm -hmm. just means upright Stand. man walking man yeah mm. standing man and they were a very successful species and they spread all over the world they made it up to the, to northern China. They made it out to the islands of Indonesia. Yeah. We still don't know how they got there, but uh, and that was before we had even evolved. So they were very successful, very widely, wide, widely spread species. And then, of course, everyone's heard of Neanderthals, mm -hmm. who were even more like us. They arose later. Mm -hmm. They were very, very similar to us. And they lived in Europe and the Middle East and probably elsewhere for perhaps 200,000 years, surviving ice ages and so on. So they were very well adapted. Right. What happened to them? Well, it's still being debated, but what is undeniable is that after we evolved and some of us left Africa, 
we moved into the same places where the Neanderthals and the Homo erectus lived. And within a few thousand years, they were gone. Hmm. Gone is not so, the same as hidden. It means they weren't extinct. Okay, because they're so, all, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, so now this is something that happens all the time in the history of life. Something might be very well adapted to its environment, but if a new uh, creature reaches their territory, it might exploit the environment better. It might outcompete them indirectly by being able to get the food better than they can. Uh -huh. Or it might be a, a dangerous predator. Mm -hmm. So in the history of life on Earth, it's happened countless thousands of times that there was some island or a continent with lots and lots of creatures with um, plant eaters and meat eaters. And then a new meat eater arrives from, I don't know, a land bridge forms or who knows. And that new predator is just faster and more dangerous than the ones that everything was adapted to. Right. And it just kills loads of species really quickly before they can adapt. Mm. And human beings have been such a predator many, many times mm -hmm. that we arrived in places like Hawaii or New Zealand or Madagascar uh, or the Americas. And we were a super predator, lots of other super predators. And after we arrived, lots of things went extinct very quickly. Including part so they, of our own species. Including probably the Neanderthals, yes. Probably, okay, probably. Okay, so I, I think we can leave it at that, right? Um, have you seen this film called um, Man from Earth? I have. Yes. You, oh, that's so nice. There's so few people that I've met who've seen this film. It's a, a film that my husband and I, we watched like God only knows how many times. And it's a very good film because it, it, is, it, it has a psychologist, a top-notch psychologist, a top-notch biologist, top-notch uh, Bible literalist, and all these people, and one curious student as well. And all of them come together and they're trying to understand this one creature right? Who seems to have uh, lived for the last, a Cro-Magnon who lives into our current age. You, you know the story. So uh, I don't know if you remember this, but he says, um, yeah, Ashley, I have already asked you a part of this question, like our balance with the environment that determines uh, if he will live or we will die. So anyway, coming back, one of the dialogues in the film was uh, that uh, they ask him, what do you think of the future of the race? You know, where are we headed? It seems like we're really going bonkers. He says, I've seen species come and go. Depend, it depends on their balance with the environment. A similar idea is also shared in the film, The Lion King. So Mufasa says, everything you see exists together in a delicate, in a delicate balance. As king, you need to understand that balance and respect all the creatures from the crawling ant to the leaping antelope. So I think we were talking a little bit about what is this balance, this harmony that uh, all species of the planet need to have with the environment. Then if you could elaborate perhaps a little points that we maybe didn't touch about uh, this, what is this delicate balance and what it is that we can take from, uh, you know, as human beings and apply it in real life in order to keep that balance, in order in order to keep our life and to keep the human life from going on as long and as much as it can. And also I want to understand, I have read about these certain bacteria which are like millions of years old. So I don't know if any studies have been conducted on trying to understand what it is that they have done right, that they have seemed to have outlived uh, uh, all other species, that they're still here despite being millions of years old. Uh, right. Well, okay, that's several questions there. Oh. On, on the topic of a harmony or a balance, mm -hmm. uh, Darwin would say that this is an illusion. Wow. That what looks like a harmonious balance out in nature mm -hmm. is in fact a war raging of all against all. When we see the, the birds singing so sweetly in the trees, well, every minute of every day, they are destroying life. Mm -hmm. They're eating seeds, they're eating insects, mm -hmm. or, whatever, or other birds or whatever. Yeah. And so in a way, life on Earth gives the appearance of being in balance, but that's actually because the arms race is kind of equal. And the predators are not completely decimating the prey because they're able to reproduce enough to make up for the losses 
that are killed by the predators. The predators aren't doing that to help their prey. They would eat them all if they could, but it's difficult. And the prey are well camouflaged or they can run away or they're poisonous to eat, whatever it is. So you get what it looks like a balance because everything is trying to stay alive. Mm -hmm. And, but some things are trying to stay alive at the expense of eating other things. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's easy to draw lessons from that to human uh, life, how to live our lives. I think those are two very different kinds of thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't see an inspiration in that. So for example, uh, a type of parasite that needs to feed on a human body or another mm -hmm. animal body for mm -hmm. part of its life cycle mm -hmm. in order to then go on and grow and reproduce and then infect another human but we wouldn't we don't like that we don't really like that particular balance but from the point of view of that parasite everything is in a harmonious balance because there's enough animals or humans around to infect mm -hmm. to to be a parasite on and grow for a while mm -hmm. so it depends on the perspective and if we if we restrict what we see in the natural world enough that it looks like a harmony and a balance, then we are not seeing the full the whole picture, which we we should do. We can we can do. Okay. So I don't think it's a good model for for uh, for human life. Now, what was the next part of your question? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. There's just one point I'd also like to make. You were talking about how uh, if we if the predator could eat all the prey, it would. But then somewhere it's kind of encoded in the way life is that we have limitations in how much we can eat. So uh, right. So there is well, limit. some of us more than others. <laughs> <laughs> but still, like if you don't compare one species with another, the fact that digestion itself, like after some point you cannot even human beings oh I, I i can i can you know eat my heart out you you will stop somewhere so this sense of limitation uh, a natural limitation on things which probably helps us keep that balance and it is when we get greedy as humans i don't know if this greed exists in the in other species because i don't know if there are bacteria that just don't stop eating that you know till they drop off and die till then they're eating i don't know and they still continue on that's a strange thing because i do find these ticks on my dogs and they just are they just keep growing and keep getting bloated i don't know what's going on but then they fall off and then i see them walking on the walls and then i don't see them anymore so i don't know but uh, it seems like a a, 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 um, a cap has been set by whatever nature evolution or some laws that nobody can seem to uh you know get past without uh, some dire consequences would you say that's a that's a nice insight to then derive it's true if you talk about an individual thing mm -hmm. right there's only so much i can eat or there's only so much a, a dog can eat but when you talk about the species of dogs or wolves or hawks um, they eat other animals and it is possible to eat them all and they go extinct this has happened oh, many many times okay yeah okay that's what i mean by they can eat them all um, you literally mean yeah. that okay it okay. can it, it it's happened millions of times in the history of life on earth uh -huh, uh -huh. often what we see is that creatures that are killed by predators a lot usually they have a lot of offspring they lay a lot of eggs or they mm. grow lots of seeds or whatever it is and on balance, a few of them live. Oh, think, for example, of sea turtles. Yeah. Everyone has seen footage of these cute little sea turtles emerging from the sand where their mothers laid the eggs and mm. they scurry down the beach. Well, all the birds and the land predators in that area, they see this, they know, and they come and they eat all they can. Mm -hmm. And they might kill most of them, but a few make it. And then, of course, a lot of them get eaten in the oceans as well before they, a few might grow up long enough to then be adults and come back and lay lots of eggs again. So the, um, there's no mechanism in nature whereby some predators can say, well, I'm really hungry and then there's only one turtle left. Right. They will eat it if they see yes. it. So the turtles are only surviving because they all emerge at once in a huge glut of numbers. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. because they are probably good at hiding mm -hmm. from predators. You know, they do their best not to get eaten, mm -hmm. but the predators are doing their best to find them. Right. So uh, the second part of the question was that there are these bacteria that have been around for millions of years that have outlived all other species that came after them. And, you know, so uh, is it also, is it then because that uh, they don't have anybody who wants to eat them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are, there are some very striking examples of species that have barely changed for millions of years, but I'm sorry to say that they don't have any special characteristic or magical thing about them. Mm -hmm. Instead, what they tend to be is something that fits their environment quite well, well enough, and nothing has come along that does what they do in their environment better. Mm -hmm. So they just carry on. Now, if you imagine that there are billions of species in the world, uh, let's go back, you know, a few hundred million years ago. Okay. And there's billions of species alive. Mm. But over the millions of years, the world is constantly changing and there's volcanoes and asteroids hit the, hit the earth and so on. Lots and lots of them go extinct, but a few of them keep going. Um, that's, I think, not surprising. And so the fact that some of them are still going today, yeah, but those are very few. Well, yeah. out of uh, all the species. So most of them mm -hmm. survive for a while, some of them for a very long while, mm -hmm. um, but eventually they usually go extinct. Mm -hmm. um, so those bacteria that you refer to and some of the other species that have lived for a very, very long time, I'm sure they have predators who eat them, <laughs> but probably just not enough to have ever killed them off. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So for example, there are some very primitive um, shellfish uh -huh. uh, whose name I forget at the moment, but um, you, we can find fossils of them, of creatures very like them. It's basically just like a little clamshell with a little worm coming okay. out the bottom. Okay. And they would live in the mud at the bottom of the sea. And the little clamshell part was the, the feeding part that would stick out at the mud where mm -hmm. it's dangerous. That's where the shell was, where the mm -hmm. soft worm is in the mud. And they would just filter out particles in the water. Well, these things have been around for hundreds of millions of years because being a, a, a worm in the mud that filters particles is good enough mm -hmm. to survive in the oceans of the world that have lots of sediment on the bottom, lots of right. mud. Right. And nothing has evolved to do that better than, than they do. So right. they're still hanging on. Right. And they're not and experimenting. That's... They're sticking with it. <laughs> ah, oh, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. I said, I said at first that there's nothing special about them. And that mm. means that their offspring will vary just as much as the, the offspring of all other species vary. That vary means that they'll differ in some little degree in some direction or another in different color, different size, different sure. in their ability to digest particles, whatever it is. Everything about every living thing varies. Mm -hmm. But if one of these organisms is very suited to its environment, it's possible that anything, any difference of varying in any direction is actually not good right. and won't survive. And so basically they just get killed off. Right. Meaning that the, that, that species just carries on its own little channel mm -hmm. that works and any little uh, beginning to go in any other direction just gets chopped off. And so that species never changes into um, any particularly different looking form. Right. Right, got it, got it. So, um, so like I was telling you earlier, we've had uh, conversations with uh, people from the world of math, from the world of language, from the world of physics. And there seems to be, from, from what I've been able to understand, some bone of contention everywhere which has got people divided, divided them into groups. So in math, there are people who believe in the existence of, uh, they have a, uh, in the platonic world, there are those who don't. In language, there are people who think that uh, uh, that language influences thought, and then there are those who don't. And in physics, it seems I if I if I could be I could be wrong, and you know, uh, uh, in 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 having understood what I'm saying, but it's the point being that there is a difference. Like in physics, people have different uh, views on what consciousness is. So, and then there are people who are on on in the somewhere in the middle. You know who have who have reconciled with this seems to be it. This does not. So there are 
these kinds of ideas that have got people divided. In biology, is there anything like that that has uh, the, the that has divided the the camp? <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Uh, if you going all the way back to the eighteen uh, hundreds when Darwin published his Origin of Species, right. most people believe that God made all the different living things, or that God had made some kind of laws of nature that that do that, mm -hmm. that make living things. Mm -hmm. Well, Darwin's book, Darwin's theory was arguing that living things simply change over time naturally. Mm -hmm. So the shorthand, mm -hmm. uh, version of his theory is where do where do the different kinds of species in the world come from his answer is they're descended from earlier ones that is they were not made from nothing like they are now mm -hmm. they're descended from ancestors who were pretty similar mm -hmm. and that's why they look the way they do so the big um divide in that would be either can you believe in god and evolution and that's that, that divide, I, I think, still exists today. Mm -hmm. So many people uh, would write Charles Darwin when he was still alive and ask him this question. Can you be a fervent believer in God and also accept evolution? Mm -hmm. And he always wrote the same thing back to them. He said, yes, of course. And he said, in fact, I think it's absurd to doubt mm -hmm. that one can believe in both because and then he would list a number of very famous scientists who did believe in both, proving that it is possible to do so. Mm -hmm. But as you suggested, there are people who will simply deny this and say, no, you cannot believe in both. Mm -hmm. You can only believe in one or the other. Mm -hmm. Some people say that. Okay, that's interesting. So uh, Darwin's idea of God, did he mean God as cannot be known or as something that cannot be explained or as the prime mover or like what was his mm. definition of what is god yeah well that changed over the course of his life as a as a young person he was brought up in the church of england mm -hmm. as a pretty normal christian not very religious actually mm -hmm. and after his voyage on the beagle and seeing the world and starting to ask himself very big questions, he began to doubt the uh, truth of Christianity, he began to doubt the stories in the Bible and mm -hmm. began to think that in order to believe these stories and these supernatural claims, mm -hmm. one would need a whole lot of evidence to accept them. That, and so he gave up his belief in Christianity, but not of a God. So he gave up the belief of the particular God mm -hmm. described in the Bible and mm -hmm. in Christianity and so on. Mm -hmm. But he never gave up belief that there was one, that there was a creator of this vast and complicated universe. He, he said once that I find it impossible to imagine this this vast and wonderful universe being the result simply of mere chance or accident. So I believe that there was some purpose, cause or beginning. Yeah. But he would also insist that as far as science and investigators have ever found, there has never been any um, break in the laws of nature that science has found and that science is studying. Mm -hmm. And so he believed he had found a new law of nature whereby species change to fit mm -hmm. a changing world. Mm -hmm. So for, the, for his readers, most of his readers were religious. Mm -hmm. And within about 15 or 20 years, the scientific debate over evolution was over in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. It's quite an amazing thing that, mm -hmm. that it happened so quickly and with such a skeptical audience. Mm -hmm. But they it came to be accepted that evolution was simply a fact. Mm -hmm. even though most of those people were Christians. So how did they do that? They did that by thinking similarly to Darwin that, well, God was so clever mm -hmm. that he designed the laws of nature 
and of biology to work in such a way that when species are going extinct all the time and leaving these holes or gaps in nature, mm -hmm. that new species can naturally arise from existing ones to fill those gaps, mm -hmm. rather than God having to come down from the clouds and zap, 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 mm -hmm. lots of species of new beetles and new snails into existence all the time to mm -hmm. replace the ones that have gone extinct. Mm -hmm. So they carried on with their religion and just thought that, ah, well, so science has found out how God made it work. Mm -hmm. See, that's how they, they kept both. Yes. Rather than thinking God individually makes the beetle and right. puts it there, right. but that he fashioned uh, the laws of nature in such a way in the first place that that wouldn't be necessary, that they would simply form naturally. Hmm. So I've seen this film, Creation, Paul Bettany and, uh, ah, uh, yes. you know, his, his, <laughs> his, his wife in real life, I forget her name, such a wonderful actress. And um, there, uh, I know because I've seen your videos and I am itty bitty familiar with your work. I know that uh, the, the, the things that you might disagree with you know, with Hux leaving label this and, uh, you know, why he delayed his work. And the book is, the film is based on a book called Annie's Box, his daughter, you know, it's based on that thing. But in the end, after he finally writes the book and uh, he gives it in his wife's hand and says, you burn it, do whatever with it, but read it once. And then she reads it. And in the end, she hands it over to him and says, may God forgive us, something like that. So the faith <laughs> still existed, but... Uh, she, the book allowed her to make room for this, for this new understanding to come in, to which she was totally, she was afraid uh, because of uh, not having faith could lead to that fear kept her away from even reading and, you know, trying to understand what he was doing. But once she read it, she was able to make room uh, for it in her own heart and her own mind and, and say, okay, yeah, so mm. something to akin to what you're saying. What, well, that what? film, um, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> despite the subtitle of the film being its creation, the true story of Charles Darwin, that film is entirely fictional. <laughs> the untrue story. All of the dialogue, <laughs> it's, it's not true at all. Emma Darwin didn't have any problem with his theory of evolution. Wow. Ever since they first got engaged, she knew about it. Hmm. She wrote little comments on his early rough drafts. 20 years before he published the book, he wrote really long 230-page rough draft of the theory as he had worked it out so far mm -hmm. but we can see in the margins her comments about oh this part's not very clear things like that so she'd always known about it right um and that's what i was saying before about how religious people back then it wasn't a uh it wasn't a complete game over to say mm -hmm. that life evolves either mm -hmm. you have to either you're religious or you uh, except evolution one or the other. Mm. That simply was not the case. And it Both. still doesn't have to be the case. Mm. So yeah, she was religious and he wasn't. Mm. But she knew all about his evolution theory. Yeah. Sure. So uh, as a historian, um, would you be able to draw for us uh, certain strains of philosophies that uh, over a period of time have driven biologists and that does even taken biology forward, some underlying philosophies that you probably find common among biologists. They might be at odds with each other, but yeah, they are there. There are, there are always, uh, I suppose you might say fashionable uh, ideologies or leading ideas in every different era of science. And one of the things that a, a young scientist needs to do is to convince everyone else that they are pursuing the same goal, the mm -hmm. acceptable goal, the orthodox goal. But sometimes people stumble on something that goes against what everyone has accepted so far. Mm -hmm. And that's tricky mm -hmm. because that can make you look like you're not playing with the team, mm -hmm. like you're going against what everyone else has, has struggled to discover and establish. Mm -hmm. And usually it turns out to be a modification. We have to modify what we thought was completely figured out before. Mm -hmm. So for example, when genetics was being born as a science around the year 
1900, 1910, and so on. The first of these geneticists argued that their, their genetics was a new science that would replace Darwinism, that new species don't arise from this process of natural selection, but, but arise through mutations. And okay. that was their turf okay. because they dealt with genes and mutations happen to genes. And so you had two schools. You had the naturalists, the people mm. who were out in the fields watching birds mm. and mice or whatever. Mm. And then you had these people in laboratories in their white lab coats, yeah. studying things under microscopes. Right. And the two didn't see things in the same way. Right. But over a few decades of quarreling and so on, it turned out that actually they were sort of talking about the same thing <laughs> and that they mutually enforced each other's work, but it right. took a long time. Sure, sure. And, and no doubt that's, mm -hmm. that sort of thing will happen again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, while I was doing my research, I just, I just typed on Google, what is evolution? You know, just, just the most basic question. And there are a couple of uh, these uh, tiny answers that came up. One of them said, the study of uh, evolution of the human species can provide insight to understanding the violence, aggression, and fear around us today. What are your thoughts on this? Is it so? How is, how is it so? And uh, how can uh, a regular everyday man benefit from this knowledge in a practical way? Yes, well, um, first of all, and when talking about what evolution is or what it's all about, I would stress that it's not, a, it's not all about human beings because there are billions and billions of species and we're just one of them. Sure. Um, and this process of change happens with them all, with mm -hmm. all of us. Mm -hmm. But if you just want to talk about humans, mm -hmm. then yes, there is a lot to be learned about why we are the way we are based on where we come from, what, what we are descended from. We are descended, of course, from other humans like us who have been around in this world for 150, perhaps 200,000 years. So a human recorded history, history as we call it, it's only about seven, eight thousand years old, hmm. and we've been around for two hundred thousand. Right. So almost all of the existence of our species, we don't know anything about it, except for from um, paleontology, archaeology, and, and so on. The, the 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 remains of our ancient ancestors, and by studying uh, scientifically how we work and behave now. Mm -hmm. Because there are things about us that only make sense because our ancestors must have done that and it worked for them in those ancient, when they were all cavemen, for example, and we had to hunt and gather and so on. There are certain things in their societies, in their survival, that meant that people who deviated from that probably didn't survive. So they, they died or they mm -hmm. didn't leave offspring. Mm -hmm. We're descended from the ones who we left. succeeded in surviving long enough mm -hmm. to have children. Mm -hmm. So we have their characteristics. And some of those characteristics include some of the uh, base differences between men and women. This is, of course, endlessly debated and will always be, but there are differences between men and women. Sure. I mean, in terms of behavior, not um, physically. Mm -hmm. And the best explanations we have is for why these exist are not just uh, socialization and culture, because culture is extremely variable mm -hmm. and changes mm -hmm. dramatically over time. Whereas when you find that men and women do the same things in all societies, in all languages and throughout all of human history, then you can't use culture or society as the explanation for why those things exist, because all the cultures and societies are different, radically different. Right. But there are some few basic things about men and women that are different that only make sense uh, in terms of where we come from and that mm -hmm. our ancestors must have behaved like that and it must have worked for them. But that's not a justification for why it's a good thing mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it just means that it's just a way of explaining how did we get to be like this? Mm -hmm. But this is not any kind of guide for mm -hmm. how we ought to be. That's right. a completely different topic. Right. And if like uh, it's, it's species that have survived, right? Often in our language and for us, we end up saying it is the love for life. But from what you're saying, uh, it is also a sense of resilience, right? That you don't want to die, so you survive. And that requires, <laughs> that, that requires resilience. When you're constantly, you know, uh, maybe going hungry for days because there's a predator around that you cannot defeat. But once the, the, the scent of the predator goes away, you come out of your cave and you go hunting again. And that, uh, so something in us drives us to, to, to live, not even to want to live, like to just break it down to fundamentals. So there is this resilience coded into, I don't know, in our DNA. So we're, would you say that we are more resilient that way than we ought to sometimes think of ourselves? We, uh, do, do you think we think of ourselves as weak and uh, uh, current, currently, like, uh, and we forget to see that we've, our ancestors who were very much like us, culturally different, maybe traditionally different, maybe, you know, spoke differently, lived differently, but fundamentally uh, the same that we too are resilient. And that's what keeps us going. And probably that is what gets translated to our love for life. And today we want to live because that, uh, that the threat of predators is, is not as much as it used to be, or maybe the form of the predator has changed and we are yet to understand the threats we are under. So we are quite okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you can you can read you can re-describe that same resilience mm. as whatever it was in those ancient ancestors that made the difference between the ones who did persevere and stick it out long enough to survive, as opposed to some who may have given up in despair. Do you think right the, Such the ancient trials? Such trials must have happened again and again and again, right? The evolution, what we call the evolutionary process is sort of like a filter. Right. In which some things get through the filter and a lot of things get stuck in the filter. Right. When things get stuck or, or dead. Right. They die. Mm -hmm. And so an organism like us who would not struggle, would not persevere, not be resilient, probably would, will perish. wouldn't make it. Yeah. yeah, and not and so so would not pass on the characteristics of, of not being perseverant to offspring, whereas right. the persevering resilient ones probably would pass on those characteristics right to their offspring. Right, but you also said uh, despair. I, I uh, like I don't know enough to comment, but it feels like on some uh, uh, logical level, on some I don't know what level, that despair was it like. 70,000 or older, 200,000 years that despair existed. I mean, if you get infection, if you get pneumonia or something, yeah, you die, right? You might have a child well, already. Some, well, sometimes, of course, those are all complicated situations. You can get an infection and you can pull through. You could, or, yes. But or what you about, could die. Or you could die. So, okay. So that I understand being the cause of death, like a natural reason, slow and painful, whatever, or overcoming it. But despair in our ancestors despair for what like is it a despair that hunger leads to not having eaten for many days i can days? think of an example here's another film you like film references yeah uh, there's a film i uh, called um unbroken oh it's set in the second world war okay it's a true story okay about some american um a bomber crew mm -hmm. whose plane crashes in the pacific and that's three men survived the crash and they're in two little inflatable lifeboats. Mm -hmm. And they're in the middle of thousands of miles of ocean. Right. They've got basically almost nothing to survive. One of them despairs. He's constantly saying, we're all gonna die. We're all gonna die. We're not gonna make it. And the others say, shut up, shut up. We'll be fine, we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And the one who was very negative and skeptical, he became more stressed and he died. He really died. And the other two uh, managed to survive long enough that a ship uh, found Finds them. them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's not that's not a fictional story. Um, so, 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 I, so both yeah. possibilities exist, essentially. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Um, 
would you have any comment to make about a world where evolution is accepted by all? Well, <laughs> you could ask me the same question. Uh, would I have any comment about a world in which everyone accepted that the earth is round? Okay. Would that really, does it really matter? Does it make any difference? I don't know. It's mm. not my job to, uh, to determine what everyone in the world thinks, but mm. apart from a small number of people, uh, the whole world, people all around the world suggest that the world is round, but except this. It's not contested anymore mm -hmm. in science. And mm -hmm. it hasn't been for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. We talked before about how science is always changing and some things are always liable to be uh, overturned or replaced with new scientific knowledge. But I want to add a footnote that there are mm -hmm. some things that will never be contested again. And the fact that the earth is a globe is will never that. be contested. That, that's done. Mm. <laughs> We're never going to have to uh, deal with that again. And evolution is another. Living things have and do change. That's done. We know this with enough evidence that you could stack the papers to the moon. In fact, we know it more precisely than we know that the earth is round. We have more evidence for evolution than the roundness of the earth, wow. which might sound surprising, but it's yes. true. Yeah. So that will never be contested again, whether or not it happens. How it works will of course continue to be debated and more will be learned about the, sure. the details of how that yeah. happens. Right. But the broad fa face uh, fact of it, no. So what's going to happen in the future about the acceptance of that, I don't know. When it comes to uh, evolution, almost the only thing people actually care about who reject this or who have a problem with it is well, human beings. Yeah. No one really has a problem with bacteria evolving or viruses like the coronavirus. Every time you hear about a new variant, the, the, another word for that is it has evolved. Mm -hmm. That yes. is the correct language. Right. The virus is evolving mm -hmm. like everything else evolves. Yeah. But when you talk about humans evolving, well, that bothers a lot of people and it always has. And I suppose it always will. Um, the only message of hope I can offer on this point is that it, doesn't need to be so um, unhappy and contentious because plenty of um, people, plenty of religious people, um, have no problem with evolution at all and carry on with their religious identities and, and lives. So, 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 so are we saying that um, the people who have a problem with human beings evolving, are they having a problem with the fact that it seems like we're the best we can get. So there is no need? Or are we saying that this, what are we saying? Like, what are we afraid of? With technology coming in, all this symbiosis is already happening. Evolution is happening in some sense right in front of our eyes, isn't it? Yep. No, I think what people object to mostly is the idea that human beings were not made by God exactly as we are now from nothing. They went from being no humans to, boom, God made them. And many religious traditions say this. Mm -hmm. And some people take it literally, and some people take it uh, metaphorically. Mm -hmm. But as far as science is concerned, we know where humans come from. And we're not we the end of... Other, end we of come the... from other primates, yeah, yeah, yeah. and evolution never stops. It's just going to keep going forever. There's no end. There's mm. no peak. There's no perfection. Mm. There's just surviving well enough thank you very much for right yeah. now so okay so we it's like we've established three certainties the earth is round for sure evolution happened <laughs> for sure and that will continue for sure <laughs> yes yes okay and um they say that uh, you're a historian of uh, bi bi biology right a historian now uh I think it's a personal question now. Yeah, that's the third category I wanted to get into. That, what made you choose bi to be a historian of biology and not of any other sciences? What pulled you towards it? Right. I think in my particular case, it's that it's a combination of my personal interests. I'm very interested in in nature and living things. Mm -hmm. So as a 
as a hobby, um, I like to watch and study wildlife. Mm -hmm. And so I also had always studied history. And so, yeah, studying the history of people studying nature mm -hmm. was inherently interesting for me. Okay, great. And uh, obviously you've heard this, so that history repeats itself. And I think this is what you probably meant that evolution will go on if evolution is the history of the species or maybe one of the histories, who knows? But yes, uh, yes. what are your thoughts on, what, what, what does that mean to you that history repeats itself? Both pros and cons. Well, when people, when we say history repeats itself, people mean that you see what looks like the same thing happening over and over again. For example, um, when a very popular um, prime minister of some of a country, uh, you know, it has a, a certain term, but then at the end of it, there's some sort of scandals and the person topples from favor and then there's a new one, right? This has happened over and over again, hundreds of times mm -hmm. all around the world. So in that sense, you could say, oh, that's history repeating itself. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, every case is actually unique. Mm -hmm. But still, it is quite interesting, isn't it? That different cases at different times at different countries can be so remarkably similar. Mm -hmm. And that's what people mean when they say uh -huh. history is repeating itself. Right, right. Um, okay, just last two questions, uh, Dr. John. Like, how has your work and your study influenced you personally and uh, maybe even your worldview as an individual? I suppose it's given me an appreciation of how small we are in the world and indeed the universe. Mm -hmm. Because normally we only hear about ourselves or perhaps big interesting animals like elephants or cats or whales or dolphins. But really life on earth has always been mostly microbes and not the big things we are familiar with. Mm -hmm. That's actually a tiny minority of the life on Earth. So life on Earth has always been planet of the microbes mm -hmm. and it always will be. When you realize that we are not what you always hear, that we're somehow the peak of evolution or the most perfect creature or something like that, that we're just one of many, many different kinds of living things uh, on this. And we're all together on this one planet. <laughs> In a way, it's a humbling perspective that uh, we are very, very small, even though we can do lots of amazing things, mm. true, but ultimately, we are one of very many and we are not as in control as we sometimes think. Well, look what happened with the pandemic. Sure. One of the most humble li uh, living things you can imagine, a virus, which some people say isn't even alive. It's so simple, so basic. Suddenly evolved mm. a, li a little differently than it had been before. And it found a new environment and it was very successful from mm. its perspective. Right. And yeah, how did it humble us? It's, it's the same how physicists, some physicists, some philosophers of physics seem to see it. Like ours is not the only planet. We're not the center of the universe. And for them, that is a humbling experience. Well, that, then um, what, what do you mean by humility? What is humility then? Then what does it still mean? Okay, we're not the best. Okay, we're not the strongest. Okay, we're not the only ones. So what does it mean to you? I, personally. I think it means I think it means holding some some sense of reserve uh, and not thinking of ourselves as the the point of nature or of existence. Uh, we're not. There is no point. Nothing is the point of nature and existence. Biology doesn't have any goals. Evolution doesn't have any goals. Mm. Uh, and it's not about progress. It doesn't progress. It's just change. 
And so that really topples a lot of our traditional arrogance about ourselves being the best at everything. Human beings are sometimes a bit arrogant. We just love to think of ourselves as the best. And well, yes, okay, we are great. We do mm. all sorts of wonderful things. Mm. But this uh, humbleness or humility I refer to is a way of keeping things in proper perspective, right. considering what we actually know about life on earth, which is that we are a small piece. Right. Like some people, when they say, see this, that uh, we're not the center of the universe, we're just a small dot and we're not the, you know, the, the governing species, they go, they topple the other way. We're nothing. So they, they, <laughs> they just go totally the other way. So if we are not everything, that means we are nothing. So, and then I don't know, because I've known people like this personally, I've, I've had uh, their, uh, their, their representations on television as characters, you know, oh, you're nothing, what were you, just a dot. So they, it, it also can go the other way, but you're saying if you keep perspective, so you're somewhere in the middle, right? Hmm. Yes, I think that's a healthy way of looking at it. Okay, I, I, th there's something I'd like to go back to. Uh, when you were talking about the film Unbroken, right? And this is the, the one who despaired, died the one who held on to the possibility of surviving this truth actually did survive so now what does this say about us like uh, when things get really difficult there is something else that helps us you know keep life is it our will is it that resilience that we were talking about earlier is it this uh, uh you know blind hope uh, or this what do you think in, in this film, if you could use it as a reference, that what really helped him and what really did not go in the favor of the guy who died? Is there a biological oh. uh, <laughs> or is it a yeah. question of psychology then? Or phil I don't know. What does it become a question of? I don't think it's, yeah, I don't think it's possible to exclude any of those factors. Um, Thanks. After all, that's the story. That's the story as told by the survivor. Um, if we were actually there and could observe, well, maybe he was um, not as skinny as the one who didn't survive. Mm -hmm. and that's why, you know, I, I don't know. There's probably lots and lots of factors involved. But one thing we do know is that um, people who are feeling more positive, who are less stressed, they tend to be healthier. Their immune system tends to be more robust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know these things. And being overly negative or pessimistic yeah it can can make you a bit less healthy and make mm -hmm. you less able to ward off mm -hmm. infections uh, and mm -hmm. so on and mm -hmm. also just psychologically of course people can suffer from depression from uh, loneliness from isolation from persecution mm -hmm. and these things all make people literally physically suffer and do less well so no, there's no silver bullet solution to any of these things, but we can at least try to understand how humans work mm. and why, you know, why we sometimes flourish and other times we don't flourish so much. <laughs> right. My last question is, do you have a favorite quote by Darwin and uh, what, what about it do you value, if you have any? <laughs> oh gosh, um, I have several favorites, but I'll share one with you, mm -hmm. which is that he said, it is, it is those that know little and not those that who know much, who say that this or that problem will never be solved by science. In other yeah. words, it's the people who are ignorant Mm -hmm. who make the big claim that science will never solve this. And the people who know a lot don't say that. This is something he had observed time and time again. People who don't know very much will make big claim, oh, science will never figure that out. Mm -hmm. He was saying, uh-uh-uh. <laughs> you don't know much. <laughs> wait, wait and see, wait and see. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so like knowledge, he... His focus was on knowledge, acquiring knowledge, staying, not think, staying ignorant, right? I think what he was saying is that people who had worked really hard to learn a lot right. had also learned to be a bit skeptical and had also learned that in the past, a lot of things were not known. 
and thought impossible mm -hmm. and over and over again they were discovered mm. whereas the ignorant person wouldn't know that mm -hmm. and could very confidently assert that will never be solved or that yeah, will yeah. never be figured out right that's what he meant very interesting with that, uh, we can conclude our conversation, Dr. John. This was so fun and uh, so many uh, things to pick up from it. Uh, and I really thank you for your time. And despite these little issues we had with the internet, thank you for being so cordial and so, so generous with your uh, insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Speaking with Dr. John helped me understand that evolution might not have a goal after all, most likely because it's been happening forever and also because it will always go on. I also understood that we are both a significant and an insignificant part of this eternity of movement and defining which is which might be a worthy and fruitful pursuit. I found a similar idea echoed in one of the lines in the book I'm currently reading, Roots by Alex Haley, where the protagonist, who is on the verge of completing his manhood training, found himself feeling very small, yet very large at the same time, and concluded that that's what it must mean to be a man, or more generally speaking, to be a human being. It will be wonderful to know your thoughts on the conversation, and if it inspired your worldview in any way, thanks for being here. I will see you soon with another interesting mind, demystifying another interesting subject. Until then, take care.